This morning we're going to be sharing a message in this series, our vision month, our vision series, and here at this church we say we are here to encounter Jesus, dwell in love, and echo hope, and that is really the call of all Christians, all people, but that's just the way that God has uh, given us the words to explain it and what we are called to do. And there's multiple ways that, that he asks us to work that out, but it comes into a circle. And I believe Tori said this last week, but I want to say it again. We all come into an encounter with Jesus that brings us into a place where we dwell in his love, dwell in the love of his people, dwell together. And those two things should cause a passion in us to echo hope. And as we echo hope to those around us, it brings that full circle so that they can encounter Jesus to dwell in love and then in turn echo hope also. And that is what we are called to do as his people. Amen? Today, today we're talking about dwelling in love. I want to start with the scripture, Genesis 25, 8. And it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wants to dwell in us, in his people, in the midst of his people. He wants us to dwell in him. Now, if you will, with me for a minute, just think about like if you're building a house, if you're building a house, maybe it's your dream house, maybe it's just a house on the way to your dream house, that's not important. But if you're building a house, you want it to be structurally sound, right? I mean, nobody should say no. No, I don't want it. You want your house to be structurally sound. You want people to feel safe in it, your family your friends, your neighbors, whoever comes over to your house, you want them to feel safe. You don't want them to come into the house and be like, you know what, I'm not sure if this house is gonna stay standing or fall over or whatever. Does our house, is, is it structurally sound or, or maybe does it look like one of those barns? Has anybody ever been uh, on a farm or passed by maybe on the highway and you see one of those barns that's been neglected? You know what I'm talking about? They're like leaning over, and you're like, I don't think I would step foot in that barn. I don't, I don't think that I would go in there. I wouldn't feel safe in that barn. So we would all say like, yeah, yeah, we, we want to be in a, a place. We want our house to feel structurally sound. We don't want our house to look like one of those barns where it's leaning over, it's unsafe and all that stuff. But now if I ask you, like, what, what is the house that we've built for God to live in, in us, look like? Now, you're like, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> it should be structurally sound. And of course we would all think that, but is that the case in our lives? Is that what happens? And as we read in this scripture, he wants to dwell with us. He wants us to build a temple. And of course, this is in the Old Testament, but we see in the New Testament that we are the temple. The Spirit of God dwells in us, in his people. And he's saying, will you build me a structurally sound temple to dwell in, in you? Yeah, you think that your house needs to be structurally sound. Yeah, you even say that the temple that you want me to dwell in, in you, you want that to be structurally sound. But is it? But is it? Does it look like a temple? You know, when I think of a, of a temple, like, think about back in the day in Jesus' 
time or before, and they built these temples. And to think of the stonework, the time that was taken to cut and to place stone. And these aren't like these little stone buildings that like we make now, you know? It's like, yeah, here's little rocks and we stack them on top of each other. These are like thousands of pounds a piece. Huge, gigantic stones. The structure was so stable, so sound. And I think about that, and I think God wants us to build in us a temple that is like those kind of temples. I'm not putting little pebbles on top of each other, building something for God to stay in. You know? He wants to dwell here. I want to take the time to place those gigantic rocks to chisel away so that they're perfectly formed. So they, like literally, they formed these rocks to be placed perfectly together. I don't even know how they did it. But my point today is that I hope that, that we ask God, God, show us how to build a temple like they did when your spirit dwelled in the temple in the Old Testament, where they took the time to chisel. They took the time to shape and to form. They took the time to place these stones exactly in the right place. so that they would not come apart. So, as we look internally, my question today is, is it, does this house that we built for God look like a temple or does it look like a dilapidated barn? Does it look like I'm not calling anybody out. I'm, I'm saying this is just a question that we all should ask ourselves, that I am asking myself. What is it that's old, that's rotten, that needs to be removed or needs to be replaced so that this temple does not crumble? What is it that makes a house a home? What, what is it, like when somebody comes into your house, they see, they see, you know, pictures probably of your family. They see, you know, maybe your clothes laying all over the place. <laughs> or maybe that's just at my house, I don't know. My kids, like literally, there was like snow pants and boots all over the house last week. Everywhere. Like literally. Like, don't you know where those things go? Yeah, but I just didn't want to put them there. But what is it? Like, I mean, they may come in and they might see like, you know, on your table some mail with your name on it. They see things that represent who you are when they come into your house. People come into our house and know that it's ours because it looks like us. It feels like us. So when people come to us, what is it in us that makes them understand and know that God is here? See, not only do we need to be structurally sound, but like everything in us should look like he is here. It should all. They should be able to come into our space to be able to see in us and say, yeah, God's there. I see his name all over everything. It's all there. What do they see? in us that, tw that tells them that Jesus dwells here, in us. 1 John 3, starting in verse 18, it says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What does this mean? It means that you can say a lot of words, but your words don't really mean anything unless they're followed up by action. Unless your deeds and truth, the truth is what actually comes out, right? What you actually do. You can say something. I'm a NASCAR driver. And I really am a professional driver, by the way. I tell everybody that. I can say that all day long. But what actually happens is going to tell the truth. I can get in one of those cars, but I cannot race one of those cars. Maybe I can. I don't know. I'm, I'm a really good driver. <laughs> Maybe I should have picked a different story. <sighs> but we can say, that's what it's saying. He's like, let's, let's not... Uh, Love in word. Let's not just say. Like, you can say, I love you. You can say it all day long. But unless the deeds, unless the actions that come behind it reinforce the words that have been spoken, then it means nothing. You can say it all day long. But unless my feet follow in that path that are going toward the fact that I love my wife, that they do those things that tell her that I love her, then whatever I say, it doesn't matter. Because that's not the truth. <laughs> verse 21, we'll go to verse 21. Beloved, if your heart if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has loved us. There is so much in there, but let me go through it just a little bit. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. What does that mean? If our heart doesn't condemn us, it's going back to that first verse that we read, and it says, let's not do it in word or just our speech, but in our deeds, our actions. Because our deeds, our actions are really what is coming out of our heart. So it's saying, listen, you can say everything, but in your heart, whatever you're feeling, that's where your actions are going to come from. That's where the stuff that you do is actually going to come from. And so it's saying, if your heart doesn't condemn you, if you're saying these things, if you're saying, I love this person, or I love everybody, and, and you know, just, I'm the best person in the world because I just love everybody. He's saying, but if your heart doesn't condemn you, because if it's not true, it's definitely going to condemn you. Your heart's definitely going to win out in that battle because your actions will not follow suit. But it says, if our hearts don't condemn us, if our hearts are where our words are speaking, if those things line up, if we're not just doing, you know, saying the words, but the deeds and the truth line up with that, and our heart doesn't condemn us, then we have confidence with God. What do we have confidence in? And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It says, we can have confidence whenever our heart doesn't condemn us, when it lines up with him. When it lines up with his commandments, we can ask him and we will receive it. 
God, why haven't you done this? And listen, I'm not saying that he answers every prayer, everything that we ask him exactly how we want, because I know that he doesn't. But I know that he does answer all these things according to his will. He does answer prayer. And we can come to him with confidence. And then when we ask, we will receive what God has for us. And what are these commandments that we're following? It says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. That we love, we believe in his son, in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love others. Those are his commandments. If you're saying like, what, what is it like the, the, the tip of the top? Love God, believe in Jesus, love people. You want your temple to be structurally sound? Do these things. It's not that these are the only things that we have to do, because we can mess up in a hundred other different ways that we shouldn't. But we need to focus on these to shore up the temple. Verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So we go through this whole thing with this whole section of Scripture, and it's saying, let's not just do things, just say things, let our actions follow them up. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Love people. Whenever we are following him, when our actions line up with our words, when we are living in truth and loving people, then we have confidence in him. Then he abides in us. If we keep his commands, he abides in us. And we in him. This word abide is the same word as dwell. The exact same word. And a couple of definitions, little lines in the definitions mean to remain, to continue to be present, to be held, kept continually. I love this. In, refer in reference to time, to continue to be or to last, or endure. In reference to a state or condition, to remain as one, not to become another, or different, or to wait for. I love this. There's so many different aspects of this word. And whenever he's telling us to abide or to dwell in him, to dwell in his love, he's asking us to stay there. He's asking us to, to, to be with him as one, to be present, to continue with him, to continue in these things that he's called us to do, to continue in loving him and to continue loving people. See, as we do this, as we love him, as we love people, as we build this temple like it should be built, then we don't ever have to worry about having a home. We don't ever have to worry about being orphans. We're not orphans. We're not homeless because we are in his family. We are with him. 
And he abides in us and we abide in him, no matter where I go. See, and that's the problem is some, sometimes we, we, we think so naturally, like this physical world. But when I read this, I, I, I think that it doesn't matter what this natural world looks like or what my home looks like in the natural because if I'm in him, I always am home. I always have a home. I could live here in Fenton or I could live in another country. I could, but I don't know. God, don't ask me, please. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. We all think that. Don't tell me you don't. But we could. It doesn't matter where we are at because wherever we're at, it's with it. It's right. It's like home is what does it say? Where your heart is? It's not the sticks and the drywall that it's built with. It's where your heart is. Home is not a place on this world. Home is a place in Him. And when we're with Him, we're home. 1 John 4, 12 says, no one has seen God at any time. Talking about love. If we love one another, God abides, God dwells in us. And his love has been perfected in us. Like there are so many scriptures and I can't get to all of them. But that talk, that they talk about Loving God and loving people. Like if you want to get to the core, to the core of where God wants us to be, that's, it's like building the foundation for the house. You say, what's the first thing to build on? Well, of course, first you have to love God. You have to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And then right in there is to love others. It's the foundation that a strong house is built on. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides or who dwells in love abides in God and God in him. I mean, it doesn't get any more plain than that. So we go back to the, what I first started with, and you're like, yeah, we need a structurally sound house to live in. People won't want to come there. Of course we need a structurally sound house. And then we think, yeah, this temple that I'm building for God to dwell in, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's structurally sound. You know, I, I do this, I do that, I, you know, read the Bible, I pray, I speak in tongues, I prophesy, I do all these things. It's got to be structurally sound, right? Well, let me tell you. 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak, I don't think they have this one. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And in this scripture, like, wait, what, why is he, like, calling out these things, you know, like prophesying and speaking in tongues, you know, in the language of the angels and 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 and, and giving to the poor? Why, why is he calling? He's not. He's saying that, you know, our temple, our house needs to be built with that. But where is your foundation? Because if the foundation isn't on loving God and loving every single person around you, that the walls that you've built will not stand. We 
We need those things. He's given us those. He wants us to help people. God is saying, help people. Love them, the orphans and the widows. Do all these things. Give to the poor. Prophesy. Do all these things. We're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do those things. And then you turn around and don't love people. And all of a sudden, the temple is crumbling. So, <laughs> we build on this love as God has commanded us. God dwells in us when we follow him, is keep his commandments. When we love him, we love people. That is the foundation of that dwelling place, is love. Because he is love. You know, like, the Bible doesn't say he is prophesying or he is giving to the poor. That's not like an, the essence of God. That's not what it says. What it says is he is love. The essence of him, he encompasses, he is love. So all those things come after and are built on our love for him and our love for those around us. that is abiding in him or dwelling in him, dwelling in love. See, in this church, I mean, talking about vision month, talking about vision this, these, these weeks, we want people to come into this place and not feel anything that is natural. Anything that is made up. Anything that is contrived. If somebody comes in here and, and, and the first thing that, or, you know, I mean, I don't know, they might see something first, but that they, the, what they see is like, ooh, they're so cool, or ooh, they did this so well, then I might as well go home. When somebody comes in these doors, you know what they should see? Ooh, God is here. Oh, well, Wait, what is that feeling that I'm having? What, why, do, why do I feel so loved here? Why is it that I, when I walked in here, I felt like home and I felt this peace and this presence? And so many people probably won't even understand what it is because they haven't encountered it yet. But if they, if they encounter anything other than who he is, then I give up. Okay, just kidding. I don't give up. I'm a, I'll just try better. See, dwelling. The dwelling place, the temple. And, and we say, you know, of course, is not the building but we come together as his people to celebrate, to grow, to learn, to be together. And we need that. But the reality of what God is speaking in this dwelling place that we're talking about is the temple that's in each and every one of us. 
That's where his spirit dwells. Yeah, his spirit comes and blows through here and does amazing things. He, of course, whenever we come together to celebrate, we come together to, to grow and to learn, to hear his word, to worship. I mean, he is here in our midst. But this isn't ultimately what it's about. What it's about is each and every one of us. Every single one of us and the call that he has for us. That his spirit wants to dwell in us. That he wants to abide with us. That he wants us to abide in him. So that people can know who he is. so that they can encounter the love that you've encountered, so that they could know Jesus to be the Son of God, to believe in his name, to trust him, to come into the family of God, to be sons and daughters, to not be orphans anymore. And he's asking us to be a part of that. And in Acts 2, starting in verse 46, I believe, it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Again, so much in this. They continued going to the temple. They t continued going to the house where they celebrated together. So they did that. We need to continue to doing that. It, like, I saw something that said, you know, like that online church is like the new thing. I'm like, no. No, it's not. I am so grateful that we can stream our services, that, that people can see when they have to be home, when they're not feeling well, when they can't get out, when they're far away, all these different things. We need that, but it does not take place of us meeting together in the temple, right? Like, we, we can't stop meeting together. They went to the temple, they were in one accord, there was unity in the body, there was love. And they were eaten in the houses. Um, I, like, I always get excited about eating. <sighs> <laughs> they got together house to house. They met with each other. It wasn't just about the Sunday morning, if you will. It wasn't just about that celebration moment. It wasn't, you know, just that one day a week we get to come together. Why? Why is it just one day a week? Well, I got this and this. and Oh, well, okay. You know, cool. And again, I'm talking to myself. I'm telling myself that because I make up the excuses too. But they came together. They went to each other's houses. And they ate, they talked about God, who he was, what he did for them. And they were praising him and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Those who were being saved didn't add to the church those that were coming from another church. He added to the church those that were being saved. That is what the church is supposed to be about. Those that don't know him, that haven't ever come into that relationship with him. That they are able to know the love that you know, that I know. That they are able to come into this place, this encounter with Jesus that brings them in a place where they can dwell in the house of God. They can dwell in his love. They can live there. That everything they need is in that place. They can be there as well. Those that were being saved, that didn't know him,
but now knew him. That is what God is calling his people to. That is what he's asking of us. Will you stand with me? I think I'm just going to end there. We need to be the church. We need to love him and to love people. We need to embody this love. When I said about, you know, what does that temple look like? like in us that we are asking God to reside in. The foundation of it should be built on love. You know, it's just so funny and a perfect little, little bitty example is whenever I was talking to the team before church and I got up to share scripture and I started talking, and Andrew and Katie's little baby was just started like what she does, because he likes my voice. It's so soothing. <laughs> but he started just going, ah, 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 you know, like yelling out. And you know what the funny thing is? I just thought, like the first thing that pops in your mind, like, oh, like why are you distracting me? Second thing that popped in my mind is like, well, at least somebody is getting excited and talking to me. <laughs> Those are the first things that pop into your mind, right? And that's just a tiny example, but you know, then I was just like, oh man, it's so cute. He likes to talk whenever I talk. He likes to make noises, because he's like, yeah, look, he's doing it, I can do it too. You know, and then all of a sudden, there's just like this love, right? I'm like, it's so cute, I just love him, he's so cute. But you take that in, in like any, other different circumstance or situation or the guy that cut you off in the car or the person that pushed their shopping cart and went right in front of you in the line and they have a lot of food in their cart. What are those first things that pop up in your mind? And those are simple little bitty things and there's way greater things examples of love and who God is and how we're supposed to be toward others. But those, even, I just think about, I was kind of, let's go down to the simplest little thing. And if I can't love people when they just like give me this weird look, even though it's probably because their stomach hurts or something. And I'm like, why you look at me across the room like that? And they're like, oh, you know, and I think they're just looking at me bad. You know what I'm saying? That we just <laughs> we love people, love him. That's what dwelling in love, staying there. It's a residence. We abide there. We don't go away. That we dwell in love for him and for others.